Hello and welcome to the Hoover Institution's 2014 Fall Retreat. I'm Chris Dower, Hoover's Director of Marketing and Strategic Communications. Our speaker in this podcast is Jack Goldsmith, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and the Henry L. Shattuck Professor of Law at Harvard University. The title of his talk is Obama's Breathtaking Expansion of a President's Power to Make War, and it was recorded on October 20th, 2014. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, the topic of my talk is President Obama's war powers legacy, and I want to start off by making clear what I mean by war powers. Um, I've written a lot about, a lot of people have written a lot about how surprising it is that President Obama continued so many of his predecessors' um, tactics and strategies in the war on terrorism that began uh, on September 11, 2001. For example, President Obama came to office saying he was going to stop or dramatically change military commissions. He continued those. He promised to close Guantanamo Bay. That hasn't happened, primarily because Congress has pushed back against it. He said he was going to end detention without trial, military detention without trial, and he basically continued the Bush theory of, of detention without trial for people held in Guantanamo Bay, which has largely been blessed by the courts now. Um, on issue after issue, state secrets doctrines, uh, surveillance policy, President Obama has, to many people's surprise, continued the basic uh, Bush administration legal policy and strategic policy as it rested in January 2009. That's not what I'm going to talk about. Um, that is, he continued Bush's policies largely in the war that began on 2001 against Islamist terrorists. What I want to talk about is something different, something that's gotten uh, less attention, and that is the power to initiate war, the power to initiate new war. And Obama actually has, as I'm going to try to convince you of today, an extraordinary legacy uh, in this context. And I think that when the history books are written, people are going to say that in terms of the precedents that he established, uh, this is some of the, these are some of the most important ones. Just uh, a brief primer, the Constitution of the United States um, uh, actually doesn't do a very good job of, of specifically allocating war powers. You might think that it does because Article I of the Constitution says that the Congress has the power to declare war, and it, of course, gives Congress the power over appropriations. Um, but the commander is also, excuse me, the president is specified in Article II as the commander-in-chief. And the, the declare war clause in Article I that Congress was given, from the beginning, it has been uncertain what it meant. It probably just meant that Congress had the power to declare war under international law. Um, it probably didn't mean as an original matter, and it certainly has not meant in practice that the president has to always receive express congressional approval before initiating conflict. And because the Constitution is not precise and has never been precise on this issue, the allocation of war powers, constitutional war powers to initiate war uh, between the branches has developed over time, over 225 or so years, through practice, through the practice of the political branches, through the president and the Congress interacting, sometimes disagreeing, sometimes having confrontations, sometimes agreeing. And so over time, it's really been precedent and practice that has defined war powers. And that's why it's so important uh, to understand what President Obama's legacy is in this regard. And the reason I think that this issue hasn't gotten the attention it deserves is because uh, of the kind of public posture that, that President Obama presents. He was obviously deeply critical of his predecessor on a variety of legal fronts related to national security. He appears at the same time that he's aggressively asserting war powers as I'm going to document, he always sort of comes off as a reluctant warrior. And so I think therefore people aren't as concerned as maybe they should be about the precedents that he's established. He's the constitutional law professor and a former civil libertarian, excuse me, a civil libertarian and a former constitutional law professor. So people tend to think, well, you know, President Obama's probably not doing anything uh, aggressive or untoward or novel in this area. Um, and of course, he's a master at, uh, at enunciating lofty constitutional principles. But I want to claim that despite all that stuff, he actually has an extraordinary legacy of war powers. Now, on the campaign trail, as, as I just said, President Obama was quite critical of his predecessor. 
and his policies in national security. He promised to restore the rule of law in national security and the like, which is why so many people were surprised when he continued uh, so many of President Bush's policies in January of, of 2009 when he became president. But on the issue I'm interested in, President Obama was unambiguously clear. And he said, as you can see on the slide, history has shown us time and again that military action is most successful when it is authorized and supported by the legislative branch. It is always preferable to have the informed consent of Congress prior to any military action. That was his view on the campaign trail, and that was also his view, his announced view as president. He, um, you recall that, um, you might recall that during the run-up to the war, uh, this is 15 months ago, when President Obama issued his famous red line that if Syria used chemical weapons, he would retaliate and punish them. And the lead up to that, uh, to, to appearing to try to fulfill that promise in August of last year and September of last year, President Obama said, I have the military authority to go in and to punish Syria even without getting congressional support. But then at the last second, he changed his mind and he gave a couple of very pow rhetorically powerful speeches that talked about the absolute importance of getting Congress on board, the importance to our democracy, the importance to the message that it sends to the world. He said in a speech um, uh, about 15 months ago, even though that he's talking about the Syria strikes in response to Assad's use or the Syrian government's use of chemical weapons, he said, even though I possess the authority to order military strikes, I believe it was right in the absence of direct or imminent threat to our security to take this debate to Congress. I believe our democracy is stronger when the president acts with the support of Congress. And I believe that America acts more effectively abroad when we stand together. So it's basically the same idea as in 2007, six years later, about the absolute importance of going to Congress. Even if he's not required to do so, even if he's not compelled to do so by his very broad understanding of, art of his own Article II powers, he's saying here and six years ago, seven years ago, I should go. And in that same speech, that same speech in September of 2013, when President Obama um, was talking about the importance of going to Congress, he uttered this line. He said, President Bush sidelined the people's representatives from the critical decisions about when we use force. He took a swipe at his predecessor. Now, I worked in the Bush administration, and the Bush administration had some very broad views about presidential power and sometimes they implemented those views in practice. But this sentence is, is, is wrong and misleading for two reasons. One, President Bush did not sideline the people's representatives from the critical decisions about when we use force. For both of the wars that he initiated, the one on, uh, following September 11 and the one uh, for the use of force in Iraq in 2003, in both of those cases, President Bush went to Congress, he proposed a congressional authorization, he engaged Congress about what the authorization should be. It was a tough political debate both times, but he fought that fight, and Congress in the end gave him expre express, express authorization to use force in both of those wars. So this sentence is just simply wrong. It's simply inaccurate as applied to the Bush administration. In that context, the Bush administration was deeply respectful in practice of separation of powers. And the second reason it's misleading is because it's President Obama who has sidelined the people's representatives from the critical decisions about when we use force. Um, he's done so in three respects, and I'm going to talk about these uh, in, in a little bit of detail. President Obama, in practice, despite the rhetoric, has um, expanded the precedents which are so uh, uh, important in this area for the, future act, for the actions of future precedents. He's done so in three areas. First. He's done so in the, con in the context of using his own inherent Article II powers. This is the idea that the president, when can the president use the military resources of the United States abroad and under what circumstances without getting support from Congress? When does the Constitution allow him to do that? President Obama has expanded that, those conceptions of his powers quite uh, dramatically. Second, he has gutted the War Powers Resolution. Um, this is the 1973 law where Congress um, really for the first and most consequential time, tried to push back against uh, the president's use of unilateral military force. I'll talk about the War Powers Resolution in a moment and how he gutted that. And then third, he, uh, President Obama expanded 
in a quite recently, in a quite dramatic and to almost every observer unconvincing way, the statutory authorization that Congress gave him to go after Al-Qaeda. He expanded that dramatically, and in so doing, he set another set of precedents that will long uh, uh, outlive his presidency. So I'm going to go through each of those, those three points. So constitutional power. Um, President Obama has three times um, articulated very broad views of his own power to use military force under the Constitution. Uh, most, perhaps most notably in Libya in 2011, this was um, the United Nations uh, Security Council authorized uh, under international law the use of force to protect civilians in Libya. And uh, the president purported to be responding to a humanitarian crisis where Gaddafi was apparently going to slaughter civilians. And so uh, NATO, including the United States, engaged in a seven-month-long campaign that ended up removing Gaddafi from power. Uh, probably, almost certainly, went beyond what the United Nations, United Nations authorized for what it's worth, but that's what they ended up doing. Now, this was a, quite a dramatic precedent from the perspective of domestic constitution because, uh, not, and for, set aside the nightmarish problems that we left in North Africa as a result of this invasion. I mean, whatever you think of Gaddafi, he, he maintained stability in that area. And there's been a huge power vacuum ever since we removed him from power. And now one of the greatest uh, centers of Islamist terrorism and greatest threats to us after the Islamic State, which I'll talk about in a second, are these various groups that are roaming three, free in Libya, largely as a result uh, of this unilateral use of force. But the reason that this was an important president is because this is one of the, the only time that the Obama administration actually published a legal opinion. I'm going to try not to be too legalistic, but they published a legal opinion explaining why this use of force was appropriate. And it was very important for a couple of reasons. They, because this was a pure humanitarian intervention. There was no conceivable U.S. self-defense rationale. And most of the precedents and the least controversial precedents for the president using force abroad without Congress's permission or authorization has been in a situation of self-defense. In fact, the last time that we used force in Libya in 1986 was President Reagan bombing Libya in response to a bombing in uh, a Libyan bombing of, uh, of, of Americans in Germany. So the presidents do have power to use force in self-defense. When you move away from self-defense, it, um, it becomes much more um, controversial. And this stands as an important precedent that says the United States can engage in humanitarian intervention even if there's no explicit self-defense rationale. And in this case, it was because the, the main reason was that we were upholding the sanctity of the United Nations and the United Nations authorization. Now, there were some precedents for this. The Kosovo bombing in 1999, where President Clinton used force without congressional authorization for a similar humanitarian mission. But that Kosovo precedent had always been controversial. Many people thought it was illegal. There was never an opinion about it. There was never a justification about it. By basically using that rationale here and making it part of presidential legal precedents, the president established what will be the most important precedent for using humanitarian intervention uh, without congressional authorization. And that's a, it's a pretty sweeping thing to decouple the use of force in, in such a clear way from uh, a self-defense rationale. The second uh, big step was in Syria in 2013. This is the, the uh, conflict that never happened because Vladimir Putin um, uh, saved the president from an embarrassment because Congress wasn't going to authorize this war and the president had given this red line threat and Putin bailed him out by um, arranging for uh, Syria to supposedly remove its chemical weapons. But before that happened, President Obama articulated a very, very broad view of presidential power that took it a step beyond Libya, because in Syria he was going to use force, even though there was no self-defense rationale, in punishment for, a, for Syria's violation of the treaty, the Chemical Weapons Treaty, excuse me. And so basically, this, the idea here is that the, pre, the president claimed the authority to use force under the Constitution to protect regional stability and to enforce international norms. Now think about that, to protect regional stability and enforce international norms. There won't ever be an occasion when the president has an inkling to use force when those criteria aren't satisfied. So that means that the theory articulated there was pretty broad 
in basically saying that the president can use force just about, and I'm talking about, let me be clear, force from the air, not ground troops. The president can use force from the air just about whenever he thinks it needs to. Now, that theory was never put into practice in Syria, but it was put into practice, I believe, in, uh, in Iraq uh, in the last few months. Now, a lot of what's going on in terms of the bombing in Iraq and Syria against the Islamic State is, um, would, could be couched as ordinary self-defense. To the extent that the Islamic State is truly threatening the United States, it's pretty uncontroversial that the president can use force against them under the, pres under the precedence. Whether that's the situation or not, we can debate. But some aspects of the president's interventions have been purely humanitarian. Um, for example, when the president um, used force to save the, uh, the people who were trapped and under siege on Mount Sinjar and also in the town of Amarilli, he said these are pure humanitarian interventions. Now, this kind of got lost in the shuffle uh, of, of the larger problem of the Islamic State. But it's very important from a legal perspective in terms of the precedent set because this is a pure humanitarian intervention. There's no UN authorization. There's no regional authorization. It's the president on his own deciding, I need to help people under siege in another country and claiming the authority to be able to do so. And whatever you think about the morality of that, that is a very, very, very broad conception of the president's constitutional powers. The second element of the president's expansion uh, in this area has to do with the War Powers Resolution. Uh, the War Powers Resolution was enacted in 1973. A lot, some people think the War Powers Resolution in, in respects is unconstitutional. Um, the main element of the War Powers Resolution that's relevant here is that it basically requires the president to stop using force after 60 days in any situation in which U.S. troops were engaged in hostilities or in which they were in a situation of an imminent threat of hostilities. The key word in the statute is hostilities. Now, as I say, there's been a lot of talk in the last, since 1973, about whether and why this is unconstitutional, excuse me, whether and why this is permissible for Congress to limit the president in this way. Um, and um, I actually, it's actually a hard question whether it's constitutional or not. Most presidents have purported to try to comply with it, even if they say they don't like it, even if they say it's not constitutional. They've tried to comply with the War Powers Resolution. And the Obama administration has actually been quite clear that it thinks the War Powers Resolution is uh, a permissible regulation of the presidency by Congress. But what it gives with the one hand, it takes away with the other, because while it says that the War Powers Resolution is, is a permissible regulation by Congress of the president's war powers, it has essentially gutted the statute, and it's done so by interpreting the word hostilities to not be implicated by the seven-month war in, in, in uh, Libya. This, this, um, he gutted the War Powers Resolution in the context of the Libya conflict. He basically said that the seven-month war from the air, which decimated Libyan forces, which killed hundreds and hundreds of people, which removed uh, a leader from power, didn't count as hostilities. And therefore, the statute just wasn't implicated. And he didn't have to, there was no timeline, there was no clock that was triggered, and he wasn't bound by the end of the clock because the clock just wasn't running because these weren't hostilities. And this is another pretty unconvincing argument. Very few people think it's convincing. But the basic idea is, well, what hostilities means is that U.S. troops are on the ground fighting. There's a danger to U.S. troops. That's the situation. There's a danger of harm to U.S. soldiers. That's the situation that Congress was worried about in 1973. And if we're just firing bombs from the air, or better yet, from drones with no pilots, it's not hostilities. That was the theory. The third uh, prong of the president's expansion of his war powers also came through interpretation. Uh, I'm sorry about the acronym AUMF. The 2001 AUMF is the 2001 Authorization to Use Military Force. This was the law passed within days of 9-11 in which Congress gave the president, then President Bush, the authorization, the explicit authorization to use force, and I'm paraphrasing here, against the nations, organizations, and persons who were responsible for the 9-11 attacks or who harbored those who were responsible for those attacks. And um, this statute, it's now uh, 13 years later, 
And this statute has for 13 years been the legal foundation. It's a very short statute. It's been the legal foundation for the war against al-Qaeda and its associate forces. The Bush administration extended, by interpretation, I believe properly, this 2001 AUMF to include the co-belligerents of al-Qaeda, the troops that were joined at its side, the organizations that were joined at its side in fighting the United States. Um, and, but what President Obama did was he, for years and years, he said, I want to construe this statute narrowly. I actually want to try to, re he asked Congress to repeal this statute. He purported to want to declare that the war against al-Qaeda and its associates was over. That was a hope of its administration. And instead, with the rise of the Islamic State, rather than going to Congress, as he said time and time again he should do, and rather than getting a new authorization against this quite new and quite uh, menacing terrorist organization in Iraq and Syria primarily, rather than doing that, the president interpreted this 2001 law to say that Congress in 2001 authorized him to use force against the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria in 2013, even though, as the slide says, the Islamic State didn't exist in 2001 and it has no connection to al-Qaeda. Now, a predecessor organization of the Islamic State, uh, al-Qaeda in Iraq, used to have an uh, affiliation with al-Qaeda. But the successor organizations had a, f had a fundamental breach with al-Qaeda. In fact, they were fighting each other. So there's no way you can treat the Islamic State, there's no way you could have last month anyway, have treated the Islamic State as a co-belligerent of al-Qaeda. And therefore, the extension of this 2001 law to this new group basically is a dramatic expansion of what Congress did in 2001 unilaterally based on the interpretation of the president. So that's what he's done. What does it mean? Um, I think that there are four elements or maybe four ways to view the significance of what President Obama has done in expanding war powers in these ways. And I'll go through them uh, one at a time. First, and I think the most significant from the point of view of precedent, President Obama obviously made a policy decision to end the large footprint wars of his predecessor in Iraq, and hopefully he's trying, as he hopes to do in Afghanistan. They have, um, and to replace this large footprint war with what I call war from a distance. And war from a distance, or maybe stealth war is a better word for it, is basically war from the air, primarily by drones, supplemented by very secretive covert action and limited targeted use of special operations forces on the ground to help assist with these strikes from the air. And you can basically see that what President Obama has done in expanding war powers in the way he has done is to basically make war from a distance, war from especially from drones, but also from piloted aircraft with perhaps a little bit of special operations support on the ground. He's basically created the space where the president can do that on his own as much as he likes without congressional authorization. Um, he's carved out this space and the basic idea both in the war powers resolution idea of no hostilities and in the Libya and Syria and Iraq examples of uh, why those cases didn't require congressional authorization. The bottom line of what he's done is to say the Constitution, Article Two of the Constitution, allows the president to engage in war from a distance, and I should have included cyber war uh, in, in addition to war from the air in the war from a distance, because cyber war is an increasingly important component of our military force, and it too would not implicate any need to go to Congress under the president's war theories. So the first thing the president has done is basically carve out legal space under the Constitution for future presidents to be able to engage in war from a distance without congressional authorization. The second thing is, I call this um, pragmatism over principle. Maybe it should have been better called um, ad hoc decision making. And it has a couple of elements. This is just kind of a defining characteristic of the, Bush, of the Obama administration. The president is constantly saying one thing and doing another. Um, you know, red line in Syria, red line didn't exist. I'm not going to expand no matter what that 2001 AUMF and I want to repeal it and then he expands it. And another thing that he said a lot in talk but failed to do in practice is he wants to work with Congress to put his wars on a powerful legal foundation. He said this at the outset of his presidency in a famous speech he gave in 2009 at the National Archives. 
He said it again in a similar speech at the National Defense University in 2013. He kept promising to work with Congress. And the truth is that he hasn't done that. And what he's done is, is to proceed unilaterally. And he's proceeded unilaterally on the basis of legal theories that have been, at best, they seem to have been created on the fly. So, for example, there was an opinion on the Libya matter that was, that was issued in due course, but when it came to the war powers resolution and the no hostilities idea, the Justice Department and the Defense Department actually recommended to the President, Mr. President, you have to comply with the war res powers resolution. These are hostilities. You actually have to stop under the war powers resolution using force and go to Congress. And the President basically overruled the Justice Department, which has the presumptive say on this, and uh, instead agreed with his White House counsel and with the State Department legal advisor and decided that these weren't hostilities. And with subsequent, uh, subsequent uses of force, it's kind of been a joke. How do we know what the legal theories, these dramatic, how do I know what these dramatic legal theories of the Obama administration are that I'm kind of trying to flesh out? I know about them because the New York Times reporter, Charlie Savage, has given off the record interviews and sometimes snipped, not off the record, on background interviews from senior officials that give us two or three sentences about what the legal theory is. That's, and it's always at the very end, right before the bombs start fa falling or purport to start falling. And so one gets the sense, let's just put it this way, that law and these legal principles that the president purports to care about so much, I don't think they're driving the conversation from the inside. That's at least the way it seems. Um, third element is, uh, can come under the heading of failure of leadership. And here I'm speaking specifically of failure of leadership to go to Congress and do the things that the president, whether he has to as a matter of constitutional law, he should do as a matter of constitutional principle. Um, Leon Panetta's book is the most devastating memoir that I know of by a, this is, this, Panetta was, as you know, the director of the Central Intelligence Agency and the Secretary of Defense under, for President Obama. And it is just a devastating portrait of the president's leadership skills. There are a lot of interesting things in the book, but the portrait of the president's leadership skills in there is a president who's too professorial. I, can, I know of which I speak on this. He's too professorial. He doesn't understand the qualities of leadership. He doesn't understand the ways of Washington. He's not interested in having political debates with Congress. He's not interested in expending the political capital, articulating the vision that he needs to move the country to a place where Congress can support him on wars that he thinks are important. Uh, and this quote and many others like it capture President Obama's disposition on this front beautifully. And another way to see where President Obama has failed in leadership is to consider these quotes from the famous presidential historian Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. He said, the Constitution is a permanent challenge to presidential leadership, it is a test of a president's capacity to persuade Congress and the people that his policies make sense. And Schlesinger's prescription for an uncooperative Congress, for a Congress that was of another political party or didn't, was skeptical of what he wanted to do, his prescription was leaders who possess not only a personal vision, but the capacity to communicate that vision to their age and also to work to see it through. Now, President Obama complains, oh, Congress won't give me what I want, and they're, all, they're, they're uh, either too passive, or they're not interested in helping me, or they don't want to cooperate. Other presidents have faced recalcitrant or, uh, or difficult Congresses and gone to Congress and nonetheless fought for it and gotten Congress on board when necessary for their wars. President Bush, the, the second President Bush, the first President Bush in his Iraq War, Dwight D. Eisenhower twice got authorizations from Congress in the 1950s from, from skeptical Congress controlled by Democrats. The President has simply not wanted to lead on this issue, and he's just found it easier instead to go the unilateral route through expanding the precedents, rather than doing the things that he said quite eloquently in his speeches he should do in terms of going to Congress. And the last implication, and in some ways the most surprising, and I've talked about this already a bit, so I'll be brief. This is a quotation from the President's speech in May of last year, in which, not for the first time, he says, I want to engage Congress and the American people in an effort to refine and ultimately repeal the 2001 laws mandate. 
and I won't sign laws designed to expand the mandate further. There was talk a year ago, there's still talk now, there's been talk for years, that this 2001 AUMF is outdated. It was designed for a different enemy at a different time and a war of a different nature. And that what we really need to do is to have a national debate about the current array of Islamist threats and put the president's authorities on a contemporary basis where the American people can understand the costs and the benefits and the risks and the like. And um, it was in response to the idea that we need a new authorization to put this expanding Islamist threat and the war against it on a better legal and political foundation that President Obama said, no way, I'm not going to expand that mandate. We're going to continue our systematic efforts to dismantle terrorists, but this war, like all wars, must end. That's what history advises. That's what our democracy demands. Within a year, a little over a year of making that statement, not only did President Obama not cut back on the mandate, he expanded it dramatically to extend to the uh, Islamic State, as I discussed earlier. And so he basically has taken this old AUMF, and instead of doing what he has said he needs to do and what a lot of people think he needs to do, which is to have a national debate about how we address this threat going forward and put it on a contemporary foundation, he expanded the forever war, as some of his associates have called it, that they wanted to cut back on. He's expanded the forever war quite dramatically through presidential interpretation. Okay, I'll end and take your questions, but our next speaker is going to talk about midterms, so I thought I would end with the midterms. So, I think that the Obama legacy on war powers is, is important. I think it is very broad and it's very surprising. And it's not going to be viewed well over, hist over the course of history, I believe. Uh, because Precisely because the president was so articulate in explaining why he should go to Congress, but then he kept going in the other direction. There's still a chance in the last two years that that legacy, I think, can look different. Uh, and some people say that the president is finally going to go to Congress and finally going to have, uh, expend the political capital and tr finally we're going to try to put the war that's going on now on a firmer basis. And I think it's possible that if the president does that and if he seeks and, receive congressional author seeks and receives congressional authorization to use force against the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq instead of proceeding on the basis of the 2001 authorization, especially if he works with Congress on a framework statute that updates and puts this war, this very different war from 2001, on a different and firmer legal basis with contemporary congressional input, his legacy could look a lot different. However, if the past is prelude to what's going to happen in the next two years, I don't expect this to happen, even though a lot of people in the administration say they want it to. So I think we're going to basically be in the same place we are now two years from now. So I'll stop there. That was a lot of material. I'll take your questions. For more podcasts from the Hoover Institution, please visit hoover.org or Hoover's channels on either iTunes U or SoundCloud. I'm Chris Dower for the Hoover Institution. Thanks for listening.